The Oral History and Criminology Project is proud to bring you or present a conversation with Michael R. Garfitson. Uh, we're coming to you from the 2011 annual meetings of the American Society of Criminology. Uh, Michael Garfitson started his academic career as an undergraduate at the University of California, Davis, before pursuing a PhD from the School of Criminal Justice at the State University of New York at Albany, uh, and earned his degree in 1976. Um, and from 1976 to 1979, he served as the director of the Criminal Justice Research Institute. And from 1977 to uh, 81, he also served in, in an academic uh, capacity as a visiting assistant professor of criminal justice uh, and then an assistant professor at SUNY Albany. Uh, before departing uh, to the University of Illinois, where he earned tenure uh, in, a, in a position that he held from 1981 to 83. At that point, in 1983, he made a departure to back to California to the Claremont Graduate School and held the position from 80, uh, till 1985, at which point uh, he pursued other employment at the University of Arizona as a professor of management and policy, law, sociology, and psychology, uh, collapsing many diff disciplines into, uh, into one. Uh, at that point, uh, at two, from 2000 to present, he served in a variety of capacities um, in the professorial role uh, of criminology, law, society, and sociology at the University of California at Irvine, and currently uh, working in an administrative capacity as an executive vice chancellor and provost from 2005 to, to, to present. Uh, and you've also served in a variety of capacities uh, from administrative uh, posts dating back to your days at uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, as far as my survey of the scholarship, it seems as though there are three primary or dominant thrusts of uh, your, your scholarship over the years. Uh, you were instrumental in getting uh, the victimization uh, component of criminology off the ground with some of the initial efforts with the uh, National Crime Survey, which eventually matured into the NCVS. Uh, and what I think is really interesting is the application of theory uh, through the development of the, life, the lifestyle opportunity theory, uh, which was presented uh, with co-authors, uh, Mike, Michael Hindelang and uh, James Garofalo, and Victims of Personal Crime, an Empirical Foundation for Theory of Personal Victimization. You've also done uh, a variety of different uh, work on decision making within the criminal justice system uh, with your father. Yes. Uh, if, uh, and lastly, uh, more recently, there's been a variety of output uh, with, uh, in conjunction with uh, Travis Hershey, uh, a few of the major publications that, that led to uh, the ultimate uh, culmination within the uh, a general theory of crime, which appeared in 1990, uh, uh, now classic articles like Age and the Explanation of Crime, 1983, the true value of Lambda would appear to be zero, uh, 1986, the methodological adequacy of longitudinal research in crime in 1987, and the causes of white collar crime, also in 1987. Uh, for your scholarship, you've been recognized in a variety of capacities, uh, serving as the uh, Vice President of AFC in 1989 to 1990, and uh, elected fellow in 1992. Uh, also picked up the Distinguished Graduate Award from the School of Criminal Justice, the Nelson Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy from SUNY Albany in 1983, held the Beto Chair, uh, Chair Lectureship at, the Sam, at Sam Houston University in 1991, and has earned the Paul Tappan Award for Outstanding Contributions to Criminology offered by the Western Society of Criminology. Now, before you went on to fame, fortune, and glory in criminology. I, I uh, think we're done, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. What brought you into criminology? Well, a good question. Obviously, um, uh, my father, in, in part. Um, uh, I would say most, most directly when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Davis. I took a class from Travis Hershey, which was very uh, important and influential to me. And I had a job working at the law school, uh, a job that I got uh, by answering a, an ad on a bulletin board. Uh, a professor in the law school was looking for uh, someone who knew statistics and could use a computer to help with a research project. The professor was Floyd Feeney, uh, who uh, I answered the ad and, and got the job. Uh, and uh, Professor Feeney was uh, involved in studies of the criminal justice process uh, uh, 
at the new UC Davis Law School. Professor Feeney had been uh, on the President's 1967 President's Advisory Commission on Crime. He had directed one of the major task forces and established a center, a Ford Foundation Center, at UC Davis on uh, the criminal justice system. And I was lucky enough to, uh, to get on with him. And he involved the research uh, staff fundamentally in what we we're doing. And we did a study of how judges make bail decisions. And uh, he allowed me to participate in that fully, collect data and interview judges and do the statistics. And that resulted in my first publication, actually. Uh, as an undergrad. As an undergrad, how, uh, how um, uh, judges uh, make uh, bail decisions. And so uh, he actually, uh, I thought I'd go to law school. Uh, I thought that was good, good stuff. And, and Floyd said, well, actually, you kind of like doing research. And this kind of research, and I'd recommend that you go to get a PhD. Okay. And, uh, and I asked him, uh, I asked my father later, I said, Floyd, where, where would you go? Yeah. And he said, I'd go to this uh, Albany. They've got a bunch of people there who are really very good. <sighs> and um, it was really his recommendation fundamentally that uh, sent me to Albany. But that's, that's the most proximate cause. But uh, uh, influenced obviously by my father, uh, older brothers who were in psychology and doing research, a very research tradition in our and Could you tell us a, a little bit more about the, the academic environment of Albany, it seemed to be a really ripe time for just... Well, spectacular. Yeah. I mean, it, it just couldn't have been better. So the faculty were superb. The, the school, I believe, was started uh, by Nelson Rockefeller, who was the then governor oh, wow. of New York, uh, subsequent to the Attica riots, uh, the terrible prison riots that uh, took place in New York. Uh, Rockefeller and his aides uh, thought during that time that there really wasn't a good scientific and behavioral science basis for criminal justice and criminal justice policy and so forth. So someone talked to Governor Rockefeller into creating this school. They did, and they brought uh, senior people to Albany all at one time, uh, some of the most famous people in our field, uh, together. And, it was, and they created a new curriculum, a curriculum that blended behavioral science and law. Uh, it attracted a lot of a lot of students and my colleagues at the time, my student colleagues, many of uh, them have become very well-known criminologists. It was a new curriculum, an outstanding faculty, very enthusiastic uh, group of, of scholars uh, with a real uh, spirit to understand and, and describe the criminal process and, and criminal behavior from a behavioral science point of view. Who were you primarily mentored by? Oh, Michael Hindelang. So uh, Michael Hindelang was a young professor uh, at uh, Albany. Uh, when I arrived there, I th he was an assistant professor. Uh, he rapidly rose through the ranks. Uh, extraordinarily productive, brilliant guy. Um, and I actually went to Albany with the thought that I would study uh, decision making mostly mm -hmm. in the vein that, that I had done in law school, at, at that law school in okay. Davis. Uh, and there are outstanding people there. I was kind of interested in the administrative side of things. Michael Hindelang was not. He was interested in what, what we say as criminology, the causes of crime and delinquency, uh, especially uh, uh, statistical and research approach to crime and delinquency. And he was a, um, uh, a spectacular scholar, a very embracing mentor. He collected around him a lot of people, yeah. uh, me included, uh, and he just inspired people. And so I, it, uh, I basically changed my interest now, as you know, in graduate school, you might change your interest three or four times yeah. uh, before the end of the first semester. <laughs> uh, so it was Michael Hindelang who uh, was uh, so good and enthusiastic, his research skills superb, and, and he embraced graduate students. He brought them into his uh, uh, research uh, community and uh, involved us in what he was doing, and, uh, and just uh, hugely influential guy. And who, who are you most interacting with? Uh, and as far as your colleagues, your fellow students? We had a, uh, there was a, uh, a research center uh, that got started and, um, and there were just, and there were lots of projects at that research center. And as graduate students, we hung out there. Uh -huh. We hung out there our whole life, <laughs> uh, of course. And um, so seven days a week and as uh, much time as we could. And so there was a, 
uh, a really a great collection of graduate student uh, colleagues. Uh, my office mates varied from people like uh, Lawrence Cohen, who, oh, wow. who you know, yeah. uh, 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 justifiably for his uh, work in theory and, uh, and research, uh, Carl Pope, uh, William Fireherm, John Goldcamp, uh, who was in my class and we struck up a collaboration and did quite a bit of, of work together. And then over the course of time, uh, people like Robert Sampson and John Laub and uh, just uh, dozens of, of people who were attracted to that environment at the same time. It, it was a great place to be a graduate student yeah. uh, because not just the faculty who were there, Leslie Wilkins and Hans Toek and Fred Cohen and uh, Donald Newman and others, in addition to Michael Hendelang, but the graduate students. And as, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. You learn as much from the graduate students as you, as you do from uh, from the faculty. So it's just a terrific environment. Do, do you see any connection between anything in your biography that might influence or have some sort of connection with some of your research interests? Or well, sure. I'm sure there there is. I mean, we're all products of our background yeah. and so forth. So um, uh, my my father and older brothers uh, were psych all psychologists. Mm -hmm. And so they studied behavioral science and they had a research, all of them had a research uh, interest and background. If you ask my father, uh, as I have, uh, <laughs> uh, to describe himself, he would he'd say psychologist first, mm -hmm. uh, not criminologist. If, if you ask me, which you haven't done, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say criminologist. Okay. Uh, so there's, uh, so I was heavily influenced by, uh, by that family background and so forth, of course. And then by faculty who I took courses from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Travis, of course, I'm sure we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. But Michael Hendelang, uh, Michael had a, a, a kind of a psychological background as well okay. uh, in terms of his own research dispositions. Um, uh, but fundamentally systematic empirical work, survey methodology, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, And then I've always been interested in the law. Um, I kind of fell into that. Uh, at Davis, but that's been kind of a persistent uh, interest of mine too. Uh, what would you say are some of the major topics uh, that you've covered over the? Did I give an accurate characterization? Uh, too generous, I think. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think those are uh, those are right. Um, victimization that uh, uh, we worked on in Albany with um, actually most of the people that I mentioned worked on victimization projects at one time or another. Uh, at Albany with Michael and with others. Uh, and then um, always been interested in the criminal process, mm -hmm. how people make decisions, uh, what the basis of those are, and then how to make those decisions uh, better. Uh, and and, uh, and that control theory and theories of crime uh, are, are the areas that I've been most actively involved in. Now, do you see those as dis discreet and uh, self-contained, or is there something or, or am I missing a narrative that kind of informs each? Well, I, I, I think they uh, have a lot in common, actually. Yeah. Uh, and so when I, when I think about the work that Travis and I have done and the work that Michael and I have done, and actually, uh, Michael and Travis and I did work together also. Yeah. So we were uh, colleagues together, um, both of them teachers of mine, and then colleagues together uh, at Albany uh, with Michael and for a very long period of time with, with Travis. I think it's the... Um, the, the approach to, um, to science and to ideas, uh, the beliefs in a tangible real world that we can measure, that we can study it, and that we can bring behavioral science techniques, both theoretical techniques and methodological techniques to bear on understanding uh, uh, crime and delinquency. Uh, again, Michael Hendelang's uh, interest at that time strongly was in measurement. Well, that's what victimization uh, surveys were all about. Uh, at that time, yeah. still are in, in, uh, in some uh, context. Uh, then it was a new measurement technique, but survey-based. And so Travis, Michael, and I have in common the, uh, the idea of the virtues of survey research. Uh, it seems um, sort of uh, uh, commonplace now. Yeah. was not commonplace yeah. then. People didn't believe uh, in the validity of surveys. They, uh, and there was a big uh, tradition in criminology then that we were reacting against 
that that saw all of crime as artifactual and simply as a function of the type of measurement. And so, our interest then was to to try to calibrate the facts about crime using different kinds of measurement. And where does the theory come into the to the equation here? Well, um, as I would say today, and I think we uh, believe then, th theory and data. Um, completely go together. Okay. Uh, one can't really uh, have an appreciation of data without ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, those ideas are really theory. The connection between the two is what Travis taught us, actually, mm -hmm. and that's methodology. Okay. And, and the, the methodology is every bit as important as theory and data, and they are integrally related. So a theory presupposes a methodology, and methodology uh, presupposes a theory, uh, and the data can only be interpreted uh, by those two. That's a very hard overview that we yeah, have yeah. Uh, that is, le is less controversial today than it was uh, 30 years ago, for sure, when we were doing some of this early work. So do you see, do you see any real di divide between criminology and criminal justice, or are they, is that just a reified boundary? Well, I think they're, over they're very strongly overlapping to me. Okay. And a lot of people come to be interested in criminology because they're really interested in the criminal process and how uh, and ideas of social order and, and how we uh, should deal with crime and delinquency. Uh, other people come to uh, criminology by, by really thinking about the behavior and, the, uh, and its measurement. Uh, it's not long before people start thinking about the other issues. Yeah. I think that's one of the great things about this field is that it's got, uh, it's got everything. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's theories of behavior. It's 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 ideas of social process and uh, and uh, normative ideas and uh, and then it's it theories of the social order. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel constrained at all by having a criminal justice degree. It, it clearly you've broken out of that mold with your appointment. Very. Uh, I feel greatly process. enabled by it. I mean, okay. quite the opposite. I think yeah. it's. Uh, well, if I, if, I, if I wasn't interested in the field, I wouldn't have spent my whole career here. Sure. So I think, it's, yeah. uh, I think it's the most important thing to study. It, well, yeah. how could you think otherwise? <laughs> um, and, uh, and spend your life studying it, but uh, it's really got it all, I think. Um, uh, and, then, and I think one thing that is interesting about our field is that uh, you can spend your time thinking about different kinds of problems, mm -hmm. uh, even in, in thinking about about uh, criminology or criminal justice, but it asks the most fundamental questions of human existence. Mm. Uh, how can we get along with each other? Yeah. Why do people do things? Why do people kill each other? Yeah. Uh, uh, how do people organize in order to defend themselves against self-interest? Uh, uh, what's the best way to do that? Uh, what's the very nature of society? It, it is. Uh, the essential field of study, as far as I'm concerned. Huh. Um, now, when you look back on your career, which contributions do you look back? I don't. I look forward, actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> Except for conversations like this. All right. So I'm sorry. What you what, when you look back on, on your career, what what are those contributions that you think uh, you have the most pride? Well, the, the, you're most proud of. Well, those. theory. I mean, I think the uh, general theory of crime, uh, clearly, uh, is my uh, uh, is my most uh, central contribution. The theory of victimization, which has a lot in common with the theory yeah. of crime, uh, in uh, my opinion, does too. Um, so I think, uh, and I think bringing uh, data and theory together, as we try to do, the the general theory of crime, really takes a very hard argument that we, kn that we know a lot in our field. Okay. And a, and a lot of times uh, that's disparaged. And in fact, many people in our field uh, uh, act as though uh, there's not much known about crime or criminology uh -huh. or criminal justice. And we take a very strong view that, that that's not true. We know a lot. There's a lot of consistency in the research. There's a lot, of, there's a lot that's understood. Uh, comprehending it is a different matter, but uh, I think one thing that this measurement tradition has taught us, 
self-report, victimization, official data, and a, and a constant stream of excellent research over the years, uh, exploring the validity of different measures and methods of crime has taught us. We do, know, we do know a lot. There's a lot of reliability. There is a real world, and it really uh, seeks to be explained. And, uh, and that's something that our tradition, I think, has tried to emphasize. No, where was where was it? Where would the controversy come in to play that? I don't see any controversy really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you're here with Frank Coy. Uh, there's always controversy. Yeah. Like, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of, of explanation of, yeah. uh, of ideas about trying to come to terms with uh, with the facts of uh, of our existence, uh, about levels of abstraction that should be used okay. to explain um, behavior. Mm -hmm. Plenty of controversy, of course, in terms of what ought to be done about it. Even, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, and the research isn't isn't uh, doesn't lack ambiguity about those yeah. uh, those matters also. But uh, uh, but there is far less in the social and behavioral sciences today. There is far less controversy over the basic uh, nature of crime and delinquency and its factual basis than there was 30 years ago. Hmm. I'm, I'm always intrigued by the notion of where ideology kind of fits into the larger mm -hmm. conversation here. Mm -hmm. uh, is some of the controversy maybe contingent on, on some of that? Uh, I think so, but my, again, I think much less in, the, in our field uh, and in the general social and behavioral sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, people today in, in social and behavioral sciences um, readily look to a variety of disciplines for, uh, uh, for the facts of existence, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be sociology, psychology, biology, neurosciences. Uh, there's a great um, uh, interdisciplinarity that really characterizes the field in a way that it didn't at one time. Uh, there is still too much of what Travis and I refer to as uh, substantive positivism mm -hmm. alive in our field, and it's a great enemy of, of theory, yeah. actually. It's, a, it's actually an enemy of of uh, science, in our view, yeah. uh, when people take a disciplinary perspective and use the discipline and put the discipline above uh -huh. the explanation, uh, and that happens a lot, even okay. in criminology, people will, will say, I'm a sociologist, I'm a psychologist, okay. I'm a biologist, and I bring that to the explanation of crime. I think that's been a, uh, a persistent problem. Mm -hmm. uh, for the behavioral sciences, actually, not just oh, crime, and actually it's the crime and delinquency. Uh, it, it tends to characterize research about schooling and employment mm -hmm. and, uh, and the like. But, um, but there is a, a much greater appreciation today for the, uh, for the value of different disciplinary methods, uh, disciplinary ideas in, um, uh, in comprehending crime and delinquency. Now, th now, throughout your career, you have sparked some debate. I hope so. Yeah. I'm just wondering how your work has endured beyond that. How? Well, it comes from winning the debates. So, <laughs> uh, Obvious. So actually, Obvious. I think, um, uh, well, uh, something that I, that I believe, and uh, uh, obviously Travis does, uh, Michael and so forth, there's not really much virtue in work that does not yeah. create a reaction. Yeah. It, it, if, if, uh, so that's a, uh, not everyone believes that, of course, but. Yeah. Uh, but you, you seem to pick out the titans. I mean, you weren't picking out the, the scrawny little kid that you can beat up on. In, in the mid 80s, you took on the dominant paradigm, the career criminal paradigm. With, with a title like The True Value of Land <laughs> Appears to Be Zero. And, uh, and your victimization work takes on Donald Black's uh, perspective. That was, uh, well, it's important to have important adversaries. Yeah, I think, I so, think you're right. Uh, I think that's right. I, I also have, I believe, as you can tell probably from some of the later writings, uh, that, um, that we move forward best yeah. in science, all, all, all science. And I think you, if you, uh, as you interview scientists, um, that th they will likely have this same view mm -hmm. that that, that uh, we quote Darwin to this effect all observation has to be for or against some point of view mm -hmm. otherwise why do you do it okay um, it, uh, uh, it would not be uh, pretty useful or sensible so um, so the idea is to have a point of view mm -hmm. and try to try to 
um, uh, explain that point of view. Okay. The great task of a theorist, um, I think some people misunderstand this to some extent, but the task of a theorist is to always try to understand the theory. Oh. There's often a, a, a belief, I think, in, in our field and other fields that uh, a theorist explicates a theory and then that's now the theory. Oh, okay. I don't happen to have that view. Oh. I'm sure that Travis Hershey doesn't have that view either. Uh, the job of the theorist is to try to understand the theory and explicate it to the best extent possible. It's never fully understood. Somebody can always do a better job, but the... Uh, so sometimes people uh, have the idea that, well, these guys are just trying to defend their ideas. Yeah. Um, uh, that's certainly not my opinion. Yeah. Uh, the opinion is to try to understand the idea and let it speak for itself. We don't always get the idea right. Yeah. There, uh, th there really aren't new ideas, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But what we're trying to do is get the idea right. And so the, the best thing that a theorist can do is to try to explicate that idea uh, as fully as possible. And then correct it when it seems not to be explicated. But you correctly. seem to get, generate the, just the right amount of reaction. You don't want to be offering an idea and have it completely dismissed or overlooked, but at the same time, you don't want to be pilloried and, and uh, marginalized. Sure. So, so what was it about the theory and how you offered it that, that was able to move the field in the right direction? Well, we didn't, um, on the, in, the, um, in the general theory of crime, uh, it didn't, didn't come to that position immediately that Travis and I collaborate on a, on a decade long yeah. uh, uh, project. As a matter of fact, to kind of illustrate this point, uh, our work on age started out as an explication of, of uh, causal delinquency and, and uh, social control theory. Mm -hmm. uh, our intent there was to see whether that theory could account for the age effect. All right. But we concluded it couldn't. Okay. I think that surprised a lot of people. It yeah. still surprises a lot of people yeah. because the most common uh, counter uh, to us explanation for age really uses social control ideas to do it. Th that would have been, uh, I wouldn't say easy for us to do, but it would have been, it was readily available to us, let's just say that. Okay. Uh, obviously. But we came to a different conclusion. It's a conclusion that um, set us on this other direction, and the conclusion was that um, control theory as we knew it then, as we had understood it, could not account for that effect. And that, um, which caused that paper, okay. uh, which basically argues age is, has a direct effect on crime, and then led us to a whole series of other um, explorations. So that, our work together was evolved then as a different explication of control theory. Okay. Uh, they tried to take into account new facts, n not available in the 60s, mm -hmm. in the 70s, early 70s, uh, as we understood them then. Still doing that today, even at this conference, trying to figure out what would control theory say about what we know the facts to be today, mm -hmm. and to the extent that uh, it needs to be changed. You change it to try to account for the facts. So the job is to, the, our job as theorists, I think any theorist's job, uh, is to work on behalf of a theory to the extent that you can. Uh, and then um, let somebody else go after it. Uh -huh. yeah, what would you say the status of the theory is at this point? Well, I think it's faring pretty well. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's a theory that finds expression in lots of fields. All right. So uh, in, in our field of criminology, self-control theory, control theory, uh, self-restraint theory in uh, some, uh, some psychology. It's a very general uh, perspective. Uh, but as I uh, uh, look upon the facts as we know them today, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's holding up very, very well. Are there any exciting extensions of the theory that you think of? Um, well, I think so. There, there, are, um, there are two big areas of criminology active today. 
uh, in the experimental area that I think are pertinent and are, um, uh, are quite useful for evaluating the theory. Uh, one has to do with um, uh, criminal justice experiments and how deterrence works or doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big uh, findings, one of the uh, principal findings today is that deterrence in the criminal justice system doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work very well, I think, for reasons that self-control theory explains. People don't, who are, have uh, relatively low self-control don't look to the long term. So sanctions in the criminal process, which take a long time actually, uh, whatever their severity, don't really affect crime very much. And there's a growing body of research now that shows that to be true. Deterrence theory is a kind of control theory, but it's uh, a control theory that emphasizes the wrong things. In psychology, mostly, there's another kind of experiment that's going on, and that's around early childhood development and showing that variability in, um, in socialization early in life has a very profound and consequential impact on the probability of crime and delinquency and problem behaviors uh, later in life, and that's, uh, I believe, pre precisely what uh, self-control theory uh, expected to have happen. There wasn't much experimental data when we wrote the, the book. There are now um, a dozen or more good examples of purposeful variation in child rearing that now have been shown to have very uh, consequential and lasting effects on uh, the probability of engaging in crime delinquency and having um, problem behaviors uh, later in life. Switching tracks here to more of the professional orientation here. Are there any, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently or oh, lots of things. other things, other projects you wish you would have done? Well, I wish I would have worked on my three-point shot in high school. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize it was going to be so important. Uh, turns out it was, and that whole career was not uh, uh, Otherwise, I've always had two passions, actually. And so, as you mentioned, I have uh, uh, kind of uh, different careers going on in my life. One is... Uh, as a criminologist and an academic uh, research and, and uh, theorist in criminology. The other is in public universities. Uh, so I really uh, have a passion for public uh, research universities. I'm the product of one. I think they're one of the greatest inventions in American society. I think the Land Grant Act in uh, 1863 was, is one of the most important pieces of social legislation ever. Abraham Lincoln took time out in the Civil War to sign it, create uh, the opportunities for uh, millions of people uh, to have higher education that didn't depend on, s on status or station in life, uh, that that has been enormously beneficial. So I spent a lot of time in my other job uh, worrying about thinking about how to defend the interests of public research universities. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of satisfactions in that. Uh, we have, there's a lot of big stakes in that, yeah. uh, that uh, there's a lot of troubling signs about that right now in American society where uh, too many people have forgotten about the collective good that higher education um, uh, provides for and are only thinking about the individual benefit of higher education. Uh, we need to return to the idea of higher education as being a collective public good. Uh, for the long-term interest of our society, as well as the interests of, uh, uh, of people uh, who aspire to have uh, uh, social mobility and economic mobility through higher education. So I also, as you can tell, have a, uh, uh, have a strong interest in uh, something that's, that I believe is related, actually, to what we're talking about uh, in many important ways, but uh, is a different job than yeah. I have. Well, this kind of segues into another question of mine in terms of the intellectual and professional vitality of mm -hmm. criminal, criminology mm -hmm. criminal justice. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see if you were going to give it a diagnosis or a mm -hmm. sort of top to bottom assessment in terms of prospects for future expansion and growth? In, 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 uh, uh, in academia or yeah. general in society? Yeah. Well, I think it's, well, I think it's uh, lasting. Yeah. Uh, there, there are very few things that have, uh, that people have wondered about yeah. uh, longer than, than the nature of crime and its control. Uh, again, it is essential to the idea of social order and uh, to uh, 
the regulation of, of human conduct. Uh, it, it troubles us and puzzles us yeah. uh, uh, when we see it, and uh, uh, it's harmful to the interests of others. That, uh, yeah. Actually, crime, of course, being harm to others. Uh, and uh, so it, it goes right to the heart of civilization. And, uh, and so I think it's, uh, as, long as, uh, as long as people are going to be here, we're going to be interested in, uh, in the nature of crime and its control. Uh, it has, uh, the, the academic focus on crime, I think, is healthier than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And I say that because it has become uh, ever more interdisciplinary. You find people interested in these topics now in every part of the university. So I, I sit in a position in the university as uh, provost, chief yeah. academic officer uh, in the in University of California. I can see uh, uh, people doing work that I say, hey, that's criminology. Yeah. Uh, and I see it in psychology, and I see it in economics. I see it in a law school. I see it in sociology. I see it in our criminology department. I see it in the biological sciences. I see it in neurosciences. I see it in the medical school. Uh, I see it in our medical center. So it's, uh, uh, we're involved in one of the essential, uh, interesting uh, intellectual pursuits uh, uh, that there is. Uh, and it has a, uh, we've, we've come a very long way in understanding lots about crime and its control uh, and about the criminal process. Still a lot more to do. And it's a fascinating topic. If you're not interested in our field, what in the world are you interested in? I mean, it's just fascinating. And, and the answer to that is, everybody's interested in it. Yeah. You know, as a criminologist, the first thing you're actually sometimes hesitant to say to someone is, uh, I'm a criminologist, because there will then be uh -huh. a dozen questions yeah. that follow on, yeah. no matter who you're talking with. It's an inherently fascinating subject. Now, have you seen the conversation shift over the course of your career as criminology carves out its own into its own niche within the campus community here? Well, um, sure, it has shifted uh, uh, over the course of time, uh, but um, uh, I think the essential questions, and I should have put philosophy in this mix yeah, too, of course, yeah. uh, uh, are the same. What has, shift, uh, what has changed to somewhat are our methods of measurement the precision of our research and the tools and techniques that people can bring to bear on our questions. So today, there's a fascinating body of research uh, in neuroimaging, uh, crime and delinquency and justice and ideas about um, uh, morality. Every question that we ask uh, is being asked uh, today. Um, the, uh, the sophistication now in survey research is uh, just mind-boggling. It's gotten so much better. Our statistical methods have gotten better, uh, our ability to collect and analyze data. Uh, if you uh, recall how difficult it was just um, a couple of decades ago to do multivariate research, uh, that seems unlikely today uh, with uh, the high-speed computation we've got now, but people have on a laptop more computing power than we at Albany had in the entire university when we started doing victimization surveys. Uh, so that the, the, the available research tools are, are so much better, so much more refined. The other thing that's better today is the dissemination of knowledge. It's, um, it's remarkable and it's great and it's a huge beneficial consequence of, of the developments in, in computers and in inf information retrieval processing that we can, this afternoon I can look up the work of anyone at this conference uh, on a laptop, it's it's just remarkable. Yeah. Uh, we've looked back, and you expressed a preference to look forward. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna have you predict the future in terms of what what's what should be what should criminology uh, be attempting to answer next? Well, I think that the that the trends we've seen in the last decade are going to be exacerbated in the future. I think to be a criminologist in the future, one is going to have to be uh, ever more conversant with many fields. Uh, even more so than today. To be able to read in the literature, uh, one has to be able to read in diff many different kinds of literatures. Uh, so not just sociology uh, or the law or psychology, but in the behavioral sciences and in the biological sciences. Uh, we're going to have to be um, uh, conversant with an ever wider body of literature uh, than we are today. I think um, uh, on the legal side, 
a healthy trend is uh, an acquiescence and a, and a receptivity toward research and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And some of the troubling issues, issues that people have trouble about in doing things like experiments and collecting data and legal settings, uh, those barriers are being broken down and that's a wholesome development and uh, we'll see ever more uh, trends in that direction in the future. And then it's true in our field, it's true in every field, uh, the globalization of knowledge. So to be a, uh, a criminologist today means one has to be conversant with research done not just in the United States, uh, not just in Europe, but in Asia, uh, all over the world. Uh, luckily we have the tools now to make that uh, more readily available, but the globalization of, uh, of knowledge in our field is, uh, is taking place now and at a remarkable pace. And so. And so the future is easy to predict in that respect. A flattening of the world, okay. a flattening of our knowledge base, um, and, a, uh, and, and, a, and, uh, and a lot more study. It's going to be a lot harder to be a graduate student in our field uh, uh, in the future. It's going to be a lot harder to be an active scholar in our field. So you see criminology and criminal justice as being sort of a clearinghouse or um, an integrated mechanism to, to handle just the question from a variety of different angles? Well, yeah. it, it has been. I yeah. mean, and yeah. um, again, it's hard to find any discipline not interested in our yeah. topic. Yeah. There isn't one. Yeah. It's one of the great um, uh, ties that bind all the disciplines together. Yeah. I mean, you could mention literature. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, and, um, and so it's, uh, uh, it just has such a wide scope. I find myself talking about criminology. Uh, we have a hospital at our university, and I talk to the people uh, uh, in the medical center. And, mm -hmm. Uh, people in the emergency room and, and uh, a lot of their observations and interests, criminologists feel very comfortable talking about. Mm -hmm. How come there's so many young people in the emergency room? And what's the connection between crime and delinquency and risk-taking behavior and what uh, happens in the medical center? Um, it's just great. I mean, we've got the, uh, uh, we've got the most interesting questions mm -hmm. that, that daunt and trouble and excite everybody. That's why it's such a great field to be in. So what would your advice to future generations who are watching this be in terms of how you become a better, uh, better scholar? Well, I think, I think a, a, an openness and appreciation to uh, uh, the different fields, different disciplines, yeah. different uh, ways of knowing. I also think that it's important uh, to, to look to the past, to understand um, where we came from, from the uh, ideas, uh, how they were generated, how they evolved. Uh, in order to understand what the next steps are going to be. I, I couldn't have written uh, the work that I uh, wrote without, um, of course, uh, resting on the shoulders of some huge, huge uh, giants in our field, yeah. uh, all the way back to Jeremy Bentham and yeah. uh, Cesare Beccaria, yeah. and, uh, who basically wrote yeah. the same theory I did, yeah. um, uh, and of course Travis and, yeah. and Michael Handelang and all the people I've had the great uh, opportunity to work with over the years. Yeah. Well, uh, you've taken us from, from top to bottom, from Alpha to the Omega in your, your illustrious career. Uh, well, well, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the, the World History Criminology Project. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah.